Mr. Rainey, Dennis Rainey, is the president, CEO, and founder of Family Life, which is a, uh, an organization that was started to strengthen marriages for campus, uh, I guess, crusade. But it's branched out into much, much more. Super, super resources. Like I said, we've been a part of their organization off and on for, um, for 25 years, basically. He is, um, he's, he's authored more than two dozen books. He's received two golden medallions from the Evangelical Christian Publishers Association, which is a big deal. Uh, he's on the radio every day, Family Life Today. He's a co-host. And he's also on the board of the Dallas Theological Seminary uh, and the Evangelical Council for Financial Accountability. So I'm telling you, he, he is an upright man, and he's good to listen to. Uh, his teachings are just phenomenal. So we're, we've got a video now that we're going to show that kind of sets up what he's going to talk to you about. But pay attention, take notes, and uh, I know you'll enjoy. Thanks a lot. Thanks. There's room every day in every life to demonstrate courage. And courage is the ability to do the hard thing in every circumstance, despite the cost. The number one response I get, I've never done anything courageous. What hurts men the most is when they don't have a vision that calls them forth. The guy who's a husband, the guy who's a worker, the guy who's a father, the guy who's single. You are the glory of God. Yeah! If you don't step up, you're gonna fall down. Well, it's a treat to be with you men this morning. Don't you wonder what the women are saying all over campus? What are the guys doing in that meeting? And I want to echo what Joey said. Don't text what I'm saying in here. Instead of text, texting it, I want to challenge you to do it. You see, guys, when I was um, a junior in college, I had spent a lot of time wandering about spiritually. I'd come up from in a Christian home, been to Sunday school, church, Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, Wednesday nights, and yet I was at a crisis of faith in my life during my first two years of college. And I heard a man speak at a church I attended as I was a junior at the Harvard of the Ozarks. Some of you may know that as the University of Arkansas. Yeah. Anyway, this guy started and ended each of his, of his messages with a quote that hit me right between the eyes. Because you see, guys, I was struggling with my doubts. And what you need to realize is what I did is that doubts are okay if they drive you to belief. He said this. I spent a long time trying to come to grips with my doubts, when suddenly I realized I had better come to grips with what I believe. I have since moved, he said, to from the agony of questions I cannot answer to the reality of answers that I cannot escape, and it's a great relief. Did you hear what he said? He said, I had all these doubts that I was basing my life on, but suddenly I realized I needed to major in the majors, those things I knew to be true. And as a result of moving from these doubts, I based my life on that which I know to be true, the Scriptures and the truth about God. Now why do I begin this message on manhood with that quote? Because guys, I think there are a lot of doubts. A lot of confusion, a lot of fear in our hearts as men who are making our way in this culture. For the past four decades, we have been deluged with politically correct thinking which has emasculated men. It has redefined what it means to be a woman, and you don't redefine 50 percent of the population without impacting the other 50 percent. Men are portrayed on TV as wimps, strong men 
men who initiate, men who take charge are put down. They're known as sexist. And now we have a whole generation coming out of broken families and broken promises and broken marriages. And we've got men who are trying to re recall what it looks like to see a spiritual leader, to see a man that delivered the goods biblically to his family. And our screen comes up blank. And now we have the gender blender culture that has now given birth to the gender fluidity culture, where if you go on Facebook, you can check one of any 60 different choices of gender for yourself. Last time I checked Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, it says, in the image of God created He them, male and female created He them. And so, guys, the issue is, how do we feel comfortable in our skin as men? The world is looking. It's looking for the real thing. I'm not going to tell you where I got this, but I am going to read a little something, and then I'll read at the end where this came from. This was a national advertisement in a magazine, and it goes as follows. Once upon a time, men wore the pants and wore them well. Women rarely had to open doors, and little old ladies never had to cross the street alone. Men took charge because that's what they did. But somewhere along the way, the world decided it no longer needed men. Disco by disco, latte by foamy nonfat latte, men were stripped of their khakis and left stranded on the road between boyhood and androgyny. But today there are questions our genderless society has no answers for. Listen to this. The world sits idly by, it says, as cities crumble, children misbehave, and those little old ladies remain on one side of the street. For the first time since bad guys, we need heroes. We need grown-ups. We need men to put down the plastic fork, step away from the salad bar, and untie the world from the, from the tracks of complacency. It's time to get your hands dirty. It's time to answer the call of manhood. It's time to wear the pants. This was from the Dockers commercial for pants. Guys, do you hear it? The, the culture is desperate for you and me to take our rightful place as men being and doing what only men can do. Now I want you to know, I didn't come here to blame you, shame you, condemn you. Yeah, I agree. I want you to hear this, guys. I didn't come here to blame you, bash you, shame you, or condemn you. I came here because David and I talked to call you to step up, to empower you and encourage you that it's okay. In fact, it's better than okay. It is good to be the man God created you to be, and it's okay to be different from a woman. For goodness sakes, that's what they're looking for. They want us to be men. I came, gentlemen, to call you to courageously step up and fully be the man God made you to be. As never before, guys, that demands courage. C.S. Lewis said, men have chests. That's where courage originates. And we begin to feel it when one calls us out and one calls us up to take responsibility for that which is ours. Courage is doing your duty in the face of fear. Guys, you're going to have fear, lots of it. Whether it's in leading out in an organization, a church, going international to the mission field, or loving a woman. There's all kinds of fear that floods a men's soul that wants to derail us. But courage is doing your duty in the face of fear. Eddie Rickenbacker, who was a pilot in World War II, said, there can be no courage without fear. It's not wrong to be afraid, but it is wrong to be paralyzed in your fear. A number of years ago, I took my daughter on a date. She was 13 years old. 
we went to her favorite store, Abercrombie & Fitch. She was trying on this beautiful little baby blue sweater, and I let her go back to the, to the dressing room. While she was trying it on, I looked to my left, and there was a poster, a life-size poster of a buck-naked teenage young man. The picture was shot from behind. He was standing in water up to his knees, leaning against a boat dock, showing his hams and his buff body, no clothing. And I was left at that moment with a decision. I'm on a date with my daughter. I just wanted to have a good time. I didn't ask to see him. <laughs> but I asked for the manager, and I said, I just have to tell you, that's indecent. I'm a, I'm a paying customer. I got six kids. We buy a lot of clothes in here. I buy clothes in here. But that's indecent. He says, by whose standards? I said, by a thinking man's standards. That's indecent. He said, well, I beg to differ with you, sir. And I said, if that's not indecent, then I want you to drop your trousers right now and get in the same pose. He looked like a deer in the headlights. He said, huh? I said, come on, drop them. <laughs> it's not indecent. Now, I want you to know, I didn't pull out my Bible and thump him on the head, and I really was kind to him, but I was firm. I said, no, go ahead and drop them. He said, I'm not going to do it. And I said, there's a reason why you won't do it. It's because it's indecent. You'd be arrested. He said, well, if you think that's bad, you ought to see our catalog. And I go, oh, I hadn't asked to see your catalog, but it showed a teenage boy with, with four naked girls in a bed. And he flipped through it, and, and there were these articles about how to have sex with an elderly person and not step on their oxygen hose. It was mocking people. It was nuts. And I get pulled in my pocket, and I pulled out my my business card, and I gave him my business card, and I said, would you have somebody from the corporate office call me? And he looked at me, and he said, Mr. Rainey, they don't care what you think. And I said, well, you know, they may not care what I think, but I want you to know, I've got some friends. I plan on telling my friends what I think of the immorality and lack of decency about Abercrombie and Fitch wherever I get the chance. Well, that was about, uh, that was about... 18 years ago, I figure I've told somewhere north of 10 million people that story. Remember what Edmund Burke said, guys? Listen to me. All that is necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do what? Let me tell you guys, I've been in leadership in the ministry for 47 years. The easiest thing to do is nothing whether it's in an organization, or in your family, or in your marriage. There is no resistance to nothing. But there is something that God is calling us to. He is calling us to be courageous. I love what Billy Graham says, when one man takes a courageous stand, the spines of others are stiffened. You've been around them, they're infectious. A number of years ago I gave a message around five steps, and I'm going to give this very briefly, guys. But I gave a message, and I ended up building some steps to give this message as a visual illustration of how men need to literally step up courageously to the next step that God has for them. And I found in the Bible that the Bible has got some clear steps that are there that He wants us to take. And so let me just make a comment or two about these first couple, and then I want to camp on this middle step. If you can see it, it's boyhood. Boyhood. I, uh, I, I ran across a poem or a little cartoon one time that had a picture of a five-year-old boy in cut-off shorts, shirtless, and he had two cats whose tails were tied to each other, and he was carrying them like this down the dusty road. And at the bottom of the cartoon it said, and he was bound to acquire experience rapidly. That's what boyhood's all about. It's about innocence. It's about discovery, adventure. It's about finding out how, how the world operates. Truett Cathy, who 
gave leadership for a number of years to Chick-fil-A, said this, I would rather build boys than mend men. Why? Because a boy who is built properly can head up these steps very, very effectively. Boys need the direction of a strong man, a dad, a mentor. A boy without a dad is like an explorer without a map. Some of you know what I'm talking about here. You grew up without a map, and you're wondering, how do you do life? And you got angry because you were left alone. Boyhood is the first step. It's spoken of in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. Look at what Paul recognizes here. He says, when I was a child, what do you do? I spoke like a child, thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. All of us go through these initial steps, and boyhood gives way to another step that we found a way to make even bigger than it used to be. It's called adolescence. Adolescence. This is a time of great confusion, raging hormones, an identity crisis, self-doubt, selfishness, irresponsibility, anger, lust-filled eyes, and heart. We are moving from dependence upon our parents to independence from our parents, and that's good. But a boy was not meant to move through the adolescent step to the next step without a father coaching him and encouraging him along the way, and explaining to him that when certain things happen to your body in adolescence, that's normal. I mean, you wake up one morning and all of a sudden things are going haywire in your body. Nobody ever warned you about that. How are you supposed to translate that? A boy moving through adolescence was designed to receive four things from a father and a mother. Number one, his identity, his spiritual address, his spiritual identity, and secondly, increasingly, his sexual identity. What does it mean to be a man and not a, a woman? What does it mean for him to do the things that men were designed by God to do? Secondly, a boy moving through adolescence on up to the next step has to, has to be trained in how to relate to people including the opposite sex. We get so fearful when we start reaching out to the opposite sex, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But it's how, how do we love? How do we experience love? How do we forgive? The third area is character. That's the book of Proverbs. How do you choose right and not wrong? How do you become a wise man and not a fool? You need coaching. I need coaching around that. And finally, the fourth thing a boy needs is a sense of mission a sense of mission. He needs to know what his purpose is for being here, but he needs a dad to do that. I'll never forget my son, Ben, was really persecuting and prosecuting his mother. He was not an attorney by trade, but as a 16-year-old young man, he knew how to work over his mom. And finally, I had seen enough of this, and I thought, you know, this young man right here is stuck on the adolescence step, and he's not facing upwards, he's facing downward. And so I took my son, I said, let's go have a talk. And it was basically a come to Jesus conversation. I said, son, you need to know that the woman you're working over is my wife, and I love her. And you know what? You will not win. I want you to stop it. Cut it out, or I'm going to take you out back and whip your tail. Well, his eyes got about that big at that point. It took two of those come to Jesus meetings before he finally repented of his attitude toward his mom. Guys, some of us were allowed far too much freedom on this step. David let his son, Absalom, do his own thing. Says in the Scriptures, he never pained him. It meant, it meant he never disciplined him. Well, let me go on to this next step, the step 
that is all of ours to grab if we will. It's the step of manhood, the step of manhood. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 is a great passage. If you got a Bible, you should open it and just smell. There's male testosterone and male sweat in this passage right here in my Bible. Look at this. If you don't sense it as you read it, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13 and 14, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, act like men, let all that you do be done in love. I love this passage because it calls men up, it calls them to be strong and sturdy, but it also calls them to the tender side of a lover to know how to love people and care for them. A number of years ago, I had the privilege of going through a portion of Robert Lewis's men's fraternity. He gives what I believe is the best definition of masculinity that I've seen. He says this, he says, a man rejects passivity, he accepts responsibility, he leads courageously courageously, and he expects God's greater reward. I would only add one thing to that definition based upon 1 Corinthians chapter 16. I believe you need to add the phrase, he loves sacrificially. So a real man is someone who rejects passivity. He refuses to do nothing. He accepts responsibility. He leads out courageously. He initiates. He loves and dies to self sacrificially, and he expects the reward that God will give as he is God's man. How do you step up on this step called manhood? Well, I'll tell you how you do it. You begin by kneeling down. I don't think you can be, guys, listen to me, I don't think you can ever be the man who steps up beyond adolescence and achieves what God designed unless you as a man surrender to Christ. I am grateful in my life that I've had some men who modeled what sacrificial surrender looks like to Jesus Christ. Bill Bright, president and founder of Crew. I heard him say on so many times, I am a slave of Jesus Christ. I have no rights. A slave surrenders. He does the will of his master. That's your assignment and mine. Who or what you surrender to will determine the kind of man you become. There are some lesser idols. There are some that are luring you away as a man. You know them well. Don't give in. Don't worship them. It has been said, when a man stops worshiping God, he doesn't go on to worship nothing. He goes on to worship everything. First, real manhood begins with surrender. Secondly, real manhood demands that we repeatedly step away from childish things. You see, a lot of guys start this journey toward manhood, and then they straddle the manhood and adolescent step. I was, uh, I was about 28 years old when this happened in my life. I went to a writer's conference because I wanted to write a book. And while I was at the writer's conference, I stayed at the hotel. And I was on the third floor, and it had the slowest elevator in the world. And so when I was heading to the conference, I pushed the button, I could hear it grinding its way upwards, and I thought, I'm just going to go down the steps. And so I went down the steps, and guess what was on the, the platform, that first step before you go down three levels to get to the ground floor? A pornographic magazine, full spread, laid out. Now, I'm amazed how many thoughts you can have in the length of time it takes to step up and then step over something like that. I thought, man, that is some kind of body. Secondly, no one will know. Third, God will know. Fourth, I'll have to tell Barbara, my wife, 
And with that, I stepped over it and went downstairs and went to the writers' conference. At the end of the day, I came back. I really had forgotten about the magazine. I pushed the button, heard it coming. I thought, I'm just going to go up the steps. Guess what was still waiting on me? A trap. Now, guys, there are traps for you. You know where some of them are. The man who steps up has to decide he is not going to straddle the manhood and adolescence step, living part of his life in adolescence and doing boyhood, childish things. But at some point, guys, listen to me, this may be a life or death issue for you. You may say, but Dennis, it's just porn, it's just this right now. Once I get married, it'll all be good. Let me tell you, you bring it into marriage with you. I've interviewed too many people. What you have to do at this point, guys, is you have to turn away from childish things and face upwards toward the cross of Jesus Christ. Affection for Him is the only way to defeat these traps. It's not a matter of repenting over and over and over again. You have to fill your heart with a greater affection. It's why the great commandment is so important. When Jesus was asked, what is it? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Repeatedly step away and step up. Third, being a real man demands that you courageously initiate, listen to me, that you courageously initiate real relationships with real people. Let me tell you something, guys, I am really concerned about my grandchildren and this generation, because the sophistication of the porn industry, of video games, of entertainment has now gotten down to a science. They know how to program your brain and your chemistry of your brain where you're hooked, like a heroin addict. I want to start by saying, what's the first real relationship with real people you ought to focus on? the fifth commandment in the Ten Commandments. You may say, what? Remember what it says? Honor your father and your mother, that it, you, you may live a long life in the land which the Lord your God gives you. This is the first commandment with a promise. Guys, your parents were not perfect. But your assignment is to go back home with honor. I can almost tell you the day when I started my journey away from adolescence up onto manhood, I was, I was about 18 or 19 years old. I was heading away to college, and I hate to admit this, guys, but I told my mom and dad for the first time I can ever remember in my life that I loved them. And that started me on a journey where ultimately I begin to work overtime to find ways to honor my mother and father. So much so, so much so that I wrote my mom a tribute, and I wrote my dad a tribute. And as I have spoken to college men and women all over the country over the years, I wrote a book called The Forgotten Commandment. Isn't it interesting the first four commands have to do with our, our, our vertical relationship with God? And then he comes to us and he says, honor your mother and your father. Why? Because you can't be bitter and resentful toward your parents if you literally go back home with honor and you share with them what they did right. You thank them for what they provided. And that doesn't mean, by the way, you honor anything that was evil. But it does mean we become a man and we go back home with honor. I just gave you what you could give your parents for Christmas next year. They don't need a dust buster, ties, house slippers. They need honor. Take honor home to your parents. Second group that I would implore uh, implore you to cultivate is a group of guys where you get together and share your struggles, where you get real with each other and you let men into your life. Now let me just tell you something, guys. Listen to me. 
the relationships you make here at Liberty in the college years may be the most determinative friendships you establish in your entire lifetime. From those relationships, when we had a spiritual awakening at the University of Arkansas, we started a ministry of families together. We started a church that now has close to uh, 50 other churches around the country that have been started in a church of seven or 8,000 today. Those were the, the spiritual bunkers that we huddled down together, a band of brothers. And that's why at the end of this, we're going to call you to make a decision. Will you step out and get together with some guys and do some business with each other? It's so easy, it's so easy to be religious at a school like this. It's hard to get real, to let somebody else in, because you feel like you're the only one here struggling. You're not. Trust me, you're not. Finally, the other relationship I want to challenge you to explore is that of the opposite sex. Ah, yes, the opposite sex. Been married for 43 years. I have six kids, 23 grandkids. And I want to tell you something. I've made every mistake you can make in my marriage and my family. I'm not perfect. But this book, this book is the blueprint. It's how two imperfect, selfish people go the distance for a lifetime. You can't do it without humility and repentance over and over and over again. When you slide down, you step up. You admit the mistake. I have a friend who works with college men and women in the Southeast. He said, a lot of college men begin relationships today by Snapchatting. And if they get a response, they'll then send a text. And if they get a text, they'll then friend the girl on Facebook and then go fishing with her friends to find out if she'll go out with them. And maybe, just maybe then, he'll ask her out for a cup of coffee. But he's terrified to be able to do it. Guys, I want you to listen to me. Women are dangerous. <laughs> they are really dangerous. They are going to be one of God's sanctifying tools in your life. You can't be the leader, lover, and sacrificial spiritual directional leader of your family without dying to self. That's your assignment. If you want safety, go play a video game. Here's the thing, guys. I just want to challenge you, don't grow old alone. We've got a generation of my peers that are, some on their fourth, fifth, sixth marriages. It's tragic. Guys, there's a couple of ways you guys can leave here after this. One is you can go back and go, well, what is my assignment? What can I do? Well, I want to give you one. Why don't we flood the women of this campus in the next, well, for the rest of the spring semester? Why don't we flood these women with the most spectacular display of common courtesies they have ever experienced? Where you open the door, you pull out the chair, you show respect and dignity. You see, guys, I came here to help you put women in their place. It's the place the Bible has for women, honor, nobility, to be loved, to lose your life on behalf of them. You with me? If you were eating in the cafeteria and a, and a group of terrorists broke in and started shooting, real men would cover the women. They'd go after them. I just want to challenge you. 
Don't settle for less. Be God's men. Some of you may need to form some groups where you rally each other with one another to know how to better express appreciation. And by the way, just because you pulled the chair out doesn't mean she's thinking wedding bells. It's okay, guys. It's okay to have a coffee, cup of coffee. Risk it. Risk it. You're going to make some mistakes. I wasn't going to share this, but I have to share it. The first girl I asked out in college was back when we had pay phones. I called her up and said, hey, Sandy, what are you doing Saturday night? She said, nothing. Would you like to go out with me? She says, "Huh." uh <laughs> It gets better. I took a dime, my buddy Mark, who was a chiseled, handsome first base player for our, our baseball team, I said, here's a dime. You call her, ask her out for Saturday night, and if she'll go with, with you, you can use my car, because he didn't have one. I kid you not, it was not 120 seconds after I'd hung up. He calls her out, asks her what she's doing. She said nothing. Would you like to go out? And she said yes. I was walking on Friday night, and he was out in my car with the girl I wanted to go, go with. Now guys, some of that is really healthy for us as men. You know, where we realize, you know what, you may not be the greatest thing since sliced bread. Two more steps quickly, guys. Don't miss these. I'll not comment long on them, but this one is a payoff step. Mentor. Listen to me, guys. 2 Timothy 2.2. 2 Timothy 2.2 says, these things which you have heard from me, Paul said to Timothy, entrust to faithful men who will do what? Teach others also. If you forget everything else I've said this morning, guys, hear this. God made you for spiritual multiplication. He made you to be a mentor, and He made you to have a mentee, to have someone you're mentoring, and He made you also to have a mentor or someone who's teaching you and instructing you. Now one of the problems with living a good, a good long time, as I have, your mentors start dying off. I had an appointment with Chuck Colson. He was going to spend a day with me. We were going to talk about some issues on that step. But he had a more important appointment in February and went on to heaven. A mentor is available, he's purposeful, and he's authentic. Every man here needs a mentor. Every man here needs to be a mentor. Who are your mentees? Who are you pouring your life into? Your mistakes may be your greatest lessons to pass on to another. The last area, I'm not going to step on it because of its nobility, but you know what, guys? This step has become a dirty word in our culture, but it's a biblical concept. It's the picture of a patriarch, the sage. The old man who's wise, gray hair, the man who has wisdom to share. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, it is the righteous man who lives for the next generation. The righteous man lives for the next generation. But listen to me, guys. People who achieve this age, a lot of them are unplugging from life and think they have license to be able to just retire and unplug from all responsibilities. It ought to be the most fruitful years of your life. I'm looking forward to them. Now let me just make one comment about patriarchs. For those of you who are about to get out of college and get your first job out of college or your first full-time job, could I encourage you to evaluate who you work for, not just what you do? In my opinion, your 20s ought to be next to some, some guys who are patriarchs that you can snuggle in next to their wing and learn what it means to do life with them. Patriarchs are valuable because they connect us, they influence us, and they can intercede on our behalf. I haven't done it perfectly, but I have attempted to do it. I have to share one last story with you before we 
call for a little question in each of your lives. I had a 50th birthday party some years ago, and my son Benjamin was not there. He was in Estonia leading college students to Christ, living in communist block housing. Fortunately, someone pushed a record button and recorded the phone call as he shared with me the impact that I had had on his life as a dad. I've heard this maybe a hundred times. I never, I never tire of hearing it. Let's play this and listen to what Ben's words were. You know, we did pretty good. We got Ashley and Michael over here from Memphis. And we got Samuel down here from Fayetteville in a windy, rainy drive down the pig trail last night, arriving at our house at 2 in the morning. <laughs> but we couldn't arrange for a, a direct transcontinental flight from Tallinn to get uh, Benjamin here. The best we could do was to uh, get him here by telephone, and he should be on the line with us. Benjamin, are you there? I'm here. What, uh, what time is it in Tallinn? Uh, it's 5.15. 5.15? You're ready for dinner, huh? Uh, hardly. <laughs> well, you know, you know what today is, don't you? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I heard the rumor. Yeah. What, uh, what have you been thinking about today as you've reflected on your dad's 50th? Man, I've been, uh, and I apologize for the start of the conversation. I've been crying for the past five minutes. Dad, I think um, I'm looking at the same picture you guys are. I guess it's still up. It's you and me at the cross. Yes. And as I reflected on that, the one thing that stood out to me was that, Dad, no matter what we've done in the 22 years of my life, and the cross has been central to everything. You've been a trailblazer by showing us the way, by showing us that the cross is was everything to you and it should be everything to us and so i mean i know you know this but that's why i'm here and this won't mean a whole lot to uh everybody else there but um when i left this summer uh we just had a, a big uh going away at the airport and um you know i consider myself to be a pretty big guy pretty strong but uh you know even as big as i am and uh you know, as tough as I appear to be, that was, it was a hard day to, to leave, and I wrote about it in my journal. Um, I said yesterday um, was really an amazing day, leaving Little Rock. Wow. You know, I never really thought I would be so scared, uh, so not wanting to leave. But when I hugged Dad, it was as if the whole world could attack me and I'll be safe. Dad, that's how it's been my whole life. <laughs> I mean, nothing mattered at that point to me when I was hugging you. And I just want to thank you for being my dad and for showing me the way. don't have to do it perfect. You don't have to be flawless to be the man God made you to be. You just don't need to quit. I want to ask you to bow your heads with me in prayer. I want to ask you a couple of questions as you pray. What step are you standing on right now? Which one? Second question. Which direction are you facing? Are you straddling? Facing down or facing up? And finally, will you take the next step you need to take? And if you'd like to do that, because we're out of time, if you'd like me to pray over you that there's a step you need to take, perhaps with a loved one, perhaps with a choice you're making or something you're struggling with, I'd just like you to stand and I'll pray for you. If you want to be commissioned as a man to step up, 
I want to read this passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, after I pray over you. 1 Corinthians 16. Don't be, don't be straddling the steps. Father, you see these who are standing in this room. I pray that you would meet them on the step they are standing. Offer grace and mercy as you do lavishly, and lure us upward to the love of our Savior Jesus Christ. I pray for each of these men here who are standing and those who aren't, that you would encourage them to be men who pursue you and do the right thing, the courageous thing. And Father, I pray that you will give them opportunities to be the man in the days ahead. In Christ's name, I pray, amen. Have a seat. Before David comes, guys, one of the things that I asked David, I said, if I come, I'd like to get some men, and in this case, the first 250 of you who would like to go through a stepping up video series in small groups to sign up over here and to form a band of brothers where you can begin to call each other out and a place to belong to, a place to relate to, a safe place to be real in. Now, I just want to challenge you, if you've never done something like this, I know you're in all kinds of prayer groups, all kinds of groups, this is a great opportunity to discover what real manhood is all about. Almost 200,000 men have been through this, and they're going through it. Come join us at one of these groups. David.